The Code of Practice on Chief Executives and Board of Directors Workplace Safety and Health Duties was developed to help organizations, chief executives and board directors by giving them guidance on how to fulfill their legal WSH duties. In this video, we will cover five areas to give a better understanding of the Approved Code of Practice, or ACOP. The first chapter explains the intent and nature of the ACOP, while the next four chapters covers the four principles under the ACOP and their associated measures. The Manpower Minister, Dr. Tan Si Ling, during his speech at the WSH Conference 2022, explained the crucial role top management plays when it comes to safety and health. And for strong WSH culture to germinate, to grow and to flourish, it must start from the top with the chief executive and the company directors. This is because they are the ones with influence and control over budgets, over priorities and training for WSH. WSH considerations have to be entrenched as the most important and non-negotiable decisions for companies. Only the chief executive and the board can do that. They can do that. Will then, for them to be able to ultimately drive good WSH practices on the ground. The ACOP was developed to help guide chief executives and board directors fulfill their pre-existing duties under the Workplace Safety and Health Act, or WSH Act in short. The ACOP is not a law, nor does it add new legal duties on chief executives and board directors. Instead, it provides guidance on the measures that chief executives and board directors can take to help them comply with their existing legal duties under the WSH Act. The ACOP is applicable to all organizations, regardless of employment size and industry type. This legal duty applies not only to safety, but also to physical health and mental well-being. The WSH Act has been in effect since 2006 and holds corporate offices liable for WSH lapses. Section 48 of the Act states that when an organization has committed an offense, the corporate officers of that organization shall be liable for individual charges as well. Corporate officers refers to individuals in a position to make executive decisions that impacts the direction or operations of the organization. This usually refers to the chief executives and some or all of its board directors, partners in a partnership and presidents of associations. Holding the leadership of organizations liable for WSH lapses is very important as they set corporate priorities, allocate resources, and mold the culture for WSH in an organization. In 2021, a company CEO was charged under Section 48 of the WSH Act when an explosion occurred in its company's lab, killing a chemist and injuring seven others. The court found that the CEO did not establish safe work procedures nor set up a testing and maintenance system for the lab equipment. Implementing these measures could have prevented the explosion from occurring. The CEO was found guilty and sentenced to a $45,000 fine. In 2022, a total of eight top executives from various companies were convicted under Section 48 of the WSH Act for not ensuring enough measures were taken to prevent the fatalities in their workplaces. Chief executives and board directors may be found innocent for their organization's WSH lapses if they can prove that the offense had been committed without their consent or willingness and if they have exercised due diligence to prevent the offense. However, as the WSH Act does not define due diligence, this is where the ACOP comes in to lend guidance on the standard of behaviours that can be considered as exercising due diligence. The ACOP provides more clarity on the expected standard of behaviours, so adhering to the ACOP can be a mitigating factor for chief executives and board directors if their organisations are charged under the WSH Act. Adhering to the code means following its four principles. Evidence of doing so is based on whether the organization has implemented measures that support each principle. 
chief executives and board directors can refer to the 17 measures in the ACOP as examples on how to support each principle. These measures are non-exhaustive and not absolute. Organizations need to decide what is best suited in their circumstances in order to fulfill the four principles. In the event of a WSH Act prosecution, the court will assess and determine the extent to which due diligence and the exercise of care has been undertaken by the chief executive and board directors. It is how well they have fulfilled the four principles and not simply by the number of measures implemented. Conversely, not following the ACOP can be a factor to show that a defendant has fallen short of expected standards. In 2017, an expressway viaduct under construction collapsed, killing one worker and injuring 10 others. During prosecution, the court took reference to the approved code of practice on risk management in determining if the company had done enough to meet standards required by the WSH Act. It was found that the company did not adhere to the code of practice, and that was a contributing factor to the court's decision that the company had failed in their duties under the WSH Act. It was fined $1 million. The four principles in the code form the acronym C-O-R-E, signifying that it is the core responsibility of corporate officers to ensure workplace safety and health. The first principle is having clarity in who amongst the top management will have WSH responsibilities and maintain oversight on WSH matters. To have clarity, organizations should assign WSH responsibilities to specific individuals. It could be the chief executives or specific board directors. For example, organizations with a board can consider assigning one director to be responsible for this principle. Other board directors or the chief executive can then be responsible for the remaining principles. For organizations without a board, the chief executive can be responsible for all the principles. This assignment should be documented, such as in the organization's WSH policy, and communicated to staff in writing or at a town hall. Implementation of the measures under each principle may be delegated to other staff but the board director or chief executive remains responsible and accountable in ensuring that each principle is followed. The next measure is to establish a WSH policy, set standards and develop strategies towards the set standards. A WSH policy sets the tone and expectations for WSH in the organization. For example, the WSH policy can be having zero tolerance for injuries and ill health or striving for zero last time incidents, or reducing the percentage of staff having burnout. The policy should include the strategy to achieve the targets of the policy, such as to improve risk management capability through BizSafe. The second principle is building an organizational culture that prioritizes workplace safety and health. This is an essential and non-negotiable priority which will influence staff to place emphasis on WSH. Measure 3 is about having WSH commitment, where targets and results should be published publicly on organizations' channels. This should be the same standards set together with the WSH policy under Measure 2. Key performance indicators such as near-miss incidents, injury rates, and findings from mental well-being climate surveys should be tracked and analyzed to monitor progress. Measure 4 suggests that WSH be regularly tabled in the agenda of board or management meetings. For instance, WSH can be included in the terms of reference of a board committee, such as the Sustainability Committee. By tabling WSH matters in management or board meetings, it allows top management and board members to participate routinely in the WSH conversation and maintain oversight of WSH targets, learning from recent incidents or near misses. It also provides a platform for raising WSH issues to their attention and allows for high-level decisions impacting WSH to be discussed and made in a timely manner. Measure 5 recommends dedicating resources to work towards WSH outcomes. This can be in the form of allocating time and manpower to update risk assessments regularly and checking that control measures continue to be effective. Resources can also be providing training, 
personal protective equipment, getting professional advice, setting reasonable timeframes, and adopting WSH technology. Measure 6 suggests setting up avenues to report WSH matters to top management. This is to encourage employees to report on WSH issues. It can be in the form of a committee consisting of management and workers or the company's union leaders. The option to report anonymously can help allay worries and encourage employees to be more forthcoming. Measure 7 advises chief executives and board directors to be kept apprised of the WSH risks that employees face through acquiring knowledge. Chief executives and board directors can check in regularly with their WSH professionals to be kept informed of the WSH concerns in the organization and developments in the industry. They can also acquire knowledge through training and attending events or reading the WSH Council's guidelines and bulletins. Measure 8 proposes for chief executives and board directors to be proactive in engaging employees, as this demonstrates to employees that WSH is a priority. One example of how this can be done is through a pulse survey to measure staff's mental well-being. Other ways are walking the ground and speaking with employees which will also help top management to understand the work processes and their concerns. Larger corporations commonly hold town halls where employees can interact directly with the top management and have their voices heard. Smaller organizations may choose to do this at informal settings, such as over a meal or a coffee break. Organizations involved in manual work may carry out sidewalks to personally observe if employees are following safe work procedures. Measure 9 suggests taking WSH implementation beyond the organization to business vendors and partners and their employees. This creates a ripple effect, extending WSH improvements into other organizations. The ISO 45001 accreditation or BizSafe Level 3 recognition may be used as a criterion in selecting contractors based on their WSH management capabilities. Organizations may also use CheckSafe on the MOM website to view their potential contractors' WSH track records in deciding whether to select them. The third principle refers to the review of WSH management systems to ensure effectiveness. WSH management systems are essential for an organization in preventing accidents and ill health. Measure 10 suggests that chief executives and board directors have to maintain oversight and ensure that the WSH management system remains effective at all times as they can get outdated as work processes evolve. Routine audits are one way of uncovering lapses and making sure employees adhere to procedures laid down by the management system. In addition, close monitoring is necessary to make sure the safe work procedures are upheld and adhered to. Under Measure 11, chief executives and board directors should ensure that suitable, adequate, and timely risk assessments are carried out. In particular, risk assessments should be done when buying a new machine, as new hazards may be introduced. After an incident investigation as WSH lapses may be uncovered, and when new information is presented, such as a pandemic or changes to regulations. It is good practice to reevaluate risk assessments once every three years, even if there are no incidents. Measure 12 recommends incentivizing workers towards achieving good WSH performance, for example, via recognition or monetary incentives. Recognition can take the form of presenting awards at town halls, acknowledgement in corporate bulletins, or at performance appraisals. This emphasizes the importance of WSH to every worker and helps make each one a WSH advocate. Measure 13 suggests that action be taken against recalcitrant, non-compliant workers. A system to counsel employees, including supervisors who repeatedly flout WSH rules or bypass safe work procedures, can be implemented. 
It is important to stem poor behaviors to avoid having other employees pick up the same bad habits. The extent of remedial actions should match the severity and frequency of the violation. Stiffer penalties may be necessary for employees who repeatedly flout rules. The last principle is empowering employees to keep them engaged in WSH. This complements the top-down approach by enabling ground-up advocacy for WSH. Measure 14 recommends setting up a process for WSH information to be shared to all employees regularly. The WSH Council's WSH Bulletin is a convenient resource that provides WSH content. Internally, reported incidents or near misses also provide valuable learning points and should be shared with employees to prevent similar incidents. This can be done at daily toolbox meetings or through mobile group chats. Measure 15 recommends setting up a reporting system and ensuring that workers feel psychologically safe enough to report. Ensure that the reporting system is available and made known to employees and the public, and every report addressed. Even if no action is required, it should be indicated to provide a proper closure. Assurance plays an important part in encouraging participation. This can be done with anonymous reporting or giving recognition to workers who make valid reports. At work sites involving hazardous work, consider allowing workers to stop work when they sense red flags. It is better to temporarily cease work as a precaution than allow an accident to occur. Measure 16 proposes committing resources and time for workers to attend WSH training and refresher courses. The Human Resource Department, or WSH team, can identify suitable training opportunities, such as in-house training, or attend WSH forums and seminars. Ensure that training funds and protected time is allocated for workers to attend training. Measure 17 proposes to keep workers involved in the development and implementation of WSH as workers carrying out the actual work are the best judge of its effectiveness. Other stakeholders such as union leaders, contractors and vendors should also be involved in the joint development of the strategies or programs to improve its robustness and effectiveness. We have gone through the ACOP's four principles and 17 measures. To conclude, every workplace is unique and has its own set of WSH risk and challenges. There is no universal solution for everyone. You are encouraged to go through all the measures and consider which ones are most relevant to your organization. You can consider other measures with similar effect as well. Ultimately, fulfilling the core principles is more important than blindly implementing the measures. We hope this will assist and encourage top management to instill a strong WSH culture in your organization. Visit the WSH Council's website to download the ACOP, FAQs and other resources or contact us if you need any assistance.